So this is uh, Diane Feeney with the Health Services Cost Review Commission. Uh, as we usually do for these meetings, we can go around the room uh, first, uh, physically in the room, and just uh, understand who's here today. And then we can ask folks to introduce themselves who are listening on the phone. Okay. I'm Tom Ballack. I'm a partner with Discern Health and a consultant to HSCRC staff. Elsa Hiley, HSCRC. Andy Woodham, HSCRC. Linda Costa, University of Maryland. Fazi Sabi, Mid Atlantic Permanente Medical Group. Ed Veranic, Johns Hopkins. Uh, I'm Zahid Butt, CEO of Metasol. Uh, Barbara Epke, Vice President, LifeBridge Health. Madeline Shea, Delmarva Foundation. Teresa Lee, Maryland Healthcare Commission. Allison Schuster, HSCRC. Shure Cholukova, HSCRC. And for the folks on the phone, do you want to say hi? This is Dan Cochran with Shady Grove Adventist Hospital. Hi, Don Collins. Hi, Bev. Hey. Did we also have Karen on the line? This is Karen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. great. Thanks. Hi, Karen. All right. I think um, uh, we, as I sent in the email, um, we did hear from uh, Dr. Peter Pronovo's assistant that he had planned to attend the meeting. So uh, we um, will look forward to that. Um, that happen. And thanks to everyone who's um, here in the audience um, for your interest. So the uh, first agenda item is to uh, turn to a revised version of the efficiency measures report, updated draft, and um, just to kind of have um, a, a sort of dialogue or discussion around um, how we think that report is shaping up so that we can finalize that. Um, by the end, of, <coughs> toward the end of the meeting, we will go what we're into what we're going to do in sort of the next iteration of the performance measurement work group, and that was a slide deck sent after the meeting materials. Um, <coughs> so that will speak to somewhat what's going to happen uh, along the efficiency measures front uh, in terms of further development and finalization. But um, for now, we just want to sort of close this chapter of the work for for the efficiency, efficiency measurement. So um, with that, um, are there folks who would like to discuss the overall impressions or any uh, specific things that they have questions about or would like um, to uh, discuss alternatives, et cetera? Diane, uh, this is Tom Ballack. For those of you who are on the phone, I know you had a small work group who reviewed the document, maybe in a couple versions. Um, it might be helpful to share with the rest of the group what feedback you got, what the kind of the, the focal areas of interest were. Right, I, I got li quite limited feedback, and Maddie is the person who gave feedback. So, <laughs> so let's start with let's, let's start with Maddie. I liked it. I, I would say that it would be um, good if it could be even a little less dense. The content is. I respect that it is a little dense, but um, just improving the readability a little bit. But the content mm -hmm. itself and what's there um, made sense to me. And um, just shorter sentences, you know, just some basic techniques to make it even more understandable. OK, so that was the accessibility <laughs> comment. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate that. I greatly appreciate that. Uh, Diane, just for my clarification, is this is this plan to go to the commission mm -hmm. in July? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to have an idea of. of right. uh, one of the and Tracy's not here, but her point was to provide examples earlier on in the report that articulate. You know, for example, we may want to use this measure now. Um, because of needing to, for instance, um, meet the waiver model test. So I, I'm hoping that we at least achieve uh, putting that into the report and, and that it was understandable somewhat. 
And then the re most of the rest is, um, it was really more the upfront pieces that were uh, fundamentally different from the original report. And then most of the rest was really, um, th there was a little bit of tweaking to that, but there wasn't a, a lot of change to it. So Ed, um, you are on a, the subgroup too. Do you have, you want to be? Um, the, the content, I, I just said, uh, we, we referred to the short term. Mm -hmm. um, do we have a definition of the short term? Yeah. Or near term? Yeah, and so there's short term planning, and then there's short term implementation, and then there's uh, there's a, there's terms for different aspects of what we're doing. So I tr I, I tried to make that like a, an, an intuitive term, but I can clarify that it's for the next um, few months uh, this year, basically. Maybe in, like in terms of priorities, uh, you know, the present uh, PA use avoidable utilization is the priority. We want to make sure we expand that measurement and get some outpatient measures. And the second priority is, you know, the, the construction of episode-based measure and the PMPM measure are kind of um, going to have to go in tandem a little bit up to a certain point. And, and that's our second priority. And, and depending on what the adjustments we can come up with in general, then we can decide at that point whether we want to go with the PMPM or develop an episode-based measure. And in terms of the timelines, I think it's going to come at the end of the meeting, but over the summer we are thinking about the PAU analysis, start a little bit on the um, episode one, but really in the fall, really focus on the PMPM and get something ready for December. I was even more, <clears throat> uh, I guess, trying to be more concrete as far as when will these measurements have an effect on, on hospitals as far as uh, budgets, reimbursement, um, and, and you know, being a finance person, I, I think in fiscal years. Yep. So even even if it's a range, you know, 16 to 17, uh, 15 to you know, something kind of of a timeline mm -hmm. almost. I, I certainly mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. a lot to be developed, mm -hmm. and the development is different necessarily than the implementation. Right. Right. So just just to get a, a feel for, you know, as as we're doing our planning each year, what new elements are coming into play that we need to account for in 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 constructing our budgets. Right. So All right. We can. Yeah. I think add something along those lines and kind of targets rather than. Yeah. 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 Even yeah. if it's yeah, right. a range. Mm -hmm. and, sure. Even if it's like end of fiscal year. This is Dan Cochran. One of the things related to that was <clears throat> we spoke about was some of these are measurements that we're looking to measure and do comparisons, but they're not intended to be used to drive payment models. So I think not just timing of ones that do, but also mm -hmm. if we get a clarification of those that are really intended for that purpose. Yeah, clarifications uh, can be made on those issues, definitely. Did, would you have, uh, in terms of if you were to create the timeline, the sooner is the better, or <laughs> what well, is your input in there? Into this. I think part of the problem with the ones that we don't currently use is we need to make give us adequate time to make sure what the measurement is, everybody's mm -hmm. measuring the same. So some of them, although they ideally would be very soon, logistically I just don't think some of them can be implemented just because they're not being measured today. Right, right. Um, I mean, I, I guess we, we need to think about how long, you know, there is this time that will it will take to develop these measures and hope we are, our target is December, let's say. And then, um, you know, we need to think about how long then we need to feel more comfortable and with trends and then what that be for the, the payment. Well, as an example, we're, we're in calendar 14, which is a measurement period against calendar 13, which will have implications for rate year 16, mm -hmm. that 
that mm -hmm. type of information is helpful mm -hmm. from a financial perspective and planning purpose. Right. So in, in terms of the way we, we are planning to use the PAUs, for example, maybe it will be on the guardrail policy where if they miss Medicare target, then the adjustments may be based on the PAU, some adjusted PAU percentages. And that's kind of not a traditional performance improvement, but more of a scaling type tool. Um, it could be, if you get the PM, PM efficiency, that could be also a candidate for some adjustments. Um, so I, I think on the payment side, we have more um, opportunities or more options, let's say, um, to use these kind of measures. Uh, just a comment on the timing. I was not involved in the subgroup, but as I'm looking through this, I don't know, and I apologize that in the brief time since we've had this, I haven't been able to get through it in great detail, but uh, I would have some concern about the phasing at this time, uh, just because of the workload involved, and then also any sort of demonstration period to be able to look at the integrity of the data and how mm -hmm. the data looks. Uh, because you're right, some of these need to be developed further. And I guess the second part is, is uh, my question. Is there any more time for a comment period? Yes. Than this? Yes, so I would ask if uh, that was going to be my next point, which is if you all could provide comments um, by, maybe by the end of the month. Sure. Um, and then that would allow us to turn the comments around and um, get the report to, you know, the, the final phase uh, and certainly ready for the commission meeting in July. Yeah. So end of the month to the Eight. two of you. Or oh, you can send it to pay. Uh, yeah, you can send it. If you want to send email. it to the group, okay. you can send it into the all right that mailbox. Thank you. And as far as timing, it's presented at the July meeting for comment or for final. Oh, it's just a um, or or informational. Informational. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's I know this. No recommendation from staff. Okay. That's, no. Okay, any, anyone else uh, on the phone? Okay. I have one other. I, I know that we were talking about sort of the public reporting component of this and whether, you know, and I'm just wondering um, if that's addressed to people's adequacy in here in terms of how we need to take into account if these are, are publicly recorded, sort of how the, what, part of that, and, you know, what caveats do we need to be put in? Is, is that sort of reflected in here? I, I, I may have missed it. Um, I think that was, it, it, how um, I envisioned addressing that was when we established the efficiency subgroup and sort of setting the stage work by saying there are accountability various Pieces of, right, so that's where I was. I, but the, all the no, all the caveats around public reporting are not listed, but must be considered right, as part it, of the new work. Yeah. Okay. Great. Can you talk about public reporting in a general sense, where these are reported elsewhere or reported by the state? Oh, sorry. Oh, it was on. Um, so the public reporting would be by a state. By, by MACC, you mean? By MACC or by us. Um, and I think one of, for instance, is there's an example in there, one of your goals is to make pricing transparent, because Maryland has an F goal on pricing transparency. Um, so these measures speak toward how we can get at, do, at doing a better job on pricing. Um, and certainly, MACC and HSCRC would definitely work together on establishing metrics like that, and that, that was an example, I think, that was in the paper. Um, but I, I think some of these measures may be more amenable to us uh, reporting to the public, but uh, till now, MHCC has done the lion's share of the public reporting. Right. So I know you think of the, the evaluation guide as the public report. Right. Yeah. But we've also, you know, published uh, certain things like Maryland Hospital acquired conditions. So you mean the hospital rate. industry? Yes. Publicly yes. reported on the website. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, we oh welcome Dr. Peter Pornovos. Thanks for attending our meeting. Uh,
Um, and please chime in if you have comments. Um, and there, there'll also be time at the end um, for uh, anyone to, to weigh in and make comments. Um, the next uh, item on the agenda was um, just a review, an updated, um, and probably won't take as long, maybe, uh, unless the, the will of the group is to have a discussion uh, further on this, because we did um, discuss uh, pretty in depth what was on the um, the scorecard last time. I'm sorry, the I, dashboard. Dashboard. This is a dashboard. Okay. Um, so uh, I want to thank Julie. She did a lot of the edit. She did the editing, um, but uh, so. We did include the measures that the group suggested the last time. And um, we do still, in terms of next steps, have to identify the data sources and have more complete information about what these measures are. And then I think we'll talk about through the summer how we can um, get this dashboard implemented. So compared to the earlier one, based on your comments, we detailed in patient outpatient volume a little bit more. At added the uh, case mix adjusted volume measurement. And I also put a note on like the per capita for the hospital. It, like we need to come up with a measure. We don't have it now, but it's good to have it there as kind of the planning um, phase. And on the, um, I think we also try to align what we are reporting at the hospital level and the state level. And, and in some cases, state level, geographic level, there is a risk adjustment to it and there is none for the hospital piece. So we'll, we'll try to find a way to um, either risk adjust the measure or report actual numbers that are not going to be easily comparable, but can look at the trend for one hospital, if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think that makes sense. Um, I just want to say, again, uh, some comments made at the last meeting. Um, exactly what is in these dashboards we have more or less comfort with, depending on how they're shared and how public they are. Um, there's a lot of really good information on here. Um, but to this point about risk adjustment and comparability, um, we're less comfortable with that being very public. Yeah, I, I think the short way of in my mind, to deal with it is if you report an actual number and look at the trend, the actual number is not comparable because of the size of the hospitals and everything else. If As soon as you try to say a rate, then even if you try to say it's not comparable, people tend to compare. Right. So we'll try to kind of, if you're doing trending, we'll try to be, you know, and as crude as possible so that it's, it's going to be clear that they are not comparable. Who is the intended audience for this? Is this for hospitals to monitor themselves? And yes, the intended approach? is for us and sort of have a snapshot as well as for hospitals um, primarily right now. But I think it's, it's responsible policy to think about how it could be made uh, uh, understandable and accessible <laughs> to the extent that the, the information is important and helps people um, make decisions about care, et cetera. So our goal over time would be to want to have something that's much more, um, it has this kind of information, but that is much more uh, understandable to the public. Maybe that's a year or two down the road, but it, not originally or in, it, not early on. I would say um, educated, interested, in knowledgeable consumers. I think there are some interest from the public in addition to the hospital and payer industry to look at this. Uh, but obviously, um, the way we post things, you need to know where to get it and, and kind of understand the data. Uh, we acknowledge and we'll try to make it more understandable, but still it's not for an average consumer to make a decision on. So yeah. this is not something you envision to put on the public guide for the general consumer guide, but something that remains in the technical realm right. of the, the right. industry. I would say, though, even remaining in the technical realm, if there are any guidelines to those gathering the data, for instance, I'm looking at the hospital side, not the uh, state, county, region, but uh, for instance, take a look under Better Health, um, ED visits for mental health conditions and ED visits for addict addictions-related conditions 
may not be a problem in and of themselves unless there are repeat ED visits or a lack of ability to channel the patient to the right resources in the community. So if we're looking at both uh, facility health efficiency as well as population health, we may want to have some guidelines to those gathering the data as to what they should do with it ultimately. Uh, some of this is great data. Some of it hospitals already have. They don't have comparators in the state, county, region. But under the Better Health particularly, I think those Better Care, Better Health might uh, be better served if there are some guidelines or advice given with the mandate for data. Well, and I think the spirit of those in particular, the ones that you mm -hmm. pulled out, are that if you do look over time, you're not going to see those visits going up and up and up. You would expect that the trend would be um, going down um, that as people get plugged into the right kinds of services and care. But the caveats are, of course, what the population is that the exactly. hospital is serving in. Exactly. It could it be changing over time? Right. But certainly, absolutely, at a state and regional level, we would expect to see that what improvement is is those services are um, not needing to be provided in the ED. Well, revisit versus visit is key. Uh, because visit may simply reflect that the sources for care in the community are not obvious. So uh, if they're not obvious, then once someone comes into the ED for those services, hopefully they're plugged in elsewhere. But uh, revisit is more important to me, at least as a, a practitioner, than uh, visit. I forget if we've handled this before, but will these measures be available by demographic factors, such as race, ethnicity, age, gender? Um, obviously, we have geography handled here. Mm -hmm. I don't see that, but that is important to the state's equity goals. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah. We, yeah, we certainly can um, publish it by those uh, strata. Well, and I know you love this, but also payer status. Not so much the payer, but insurance versus none, because that is also why we end up seeing so many people in the ED in Maryland uh, if they're uninsured and don't have a PCP. And that actually helps us get at uh, another goal for better care, which was access, I think, or patient experience. Right. right. I think is where that was in that bucket. Okay. Well, we're, we're kind of zipping right along here. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> um, I would uh, like to hand the clicker over to uh, Dr. Zayed Bud. He's going to present um, uh, some information about the current uh, e-health measures uh, infrastructure that is hot off the presses so we know actually what, what is uh, going on uh, in terms of e-health measurement uh, toward quality. Um, so we appreciate you volunteering and sharing uh, this information with us. Yes, thank, thank you, Diane, and uh, um, the work group for allowing me to share some information, which I've been very involved with over the last uh, several years in just doing quality measurement using EHR data, and particularly since uh, the uh, high tech Act also referred to commonly as the Meaningful Use requirements. Uh, I apologize in advance that I reordered my slides a little bit last evening, didn't realize that the handouts were done earlier. So the slides are in there, but they may be out of sequence for those of you who have handouts. So I apologize for that in advance. Uh, um, OK. <laughs> Uh, but my goal this morning really is, uh, as Diane mentioned, I was asked to really um, give an overview on um, uh, the things that are going on at the federal level, especially um, uh, driven by CMS and ONC, and uh, to just try to sort of uh, uh, see through the, through the fog a little bit more because I think it will be important for uh, folks who are going to be doing performance measurement to understand the uh, um, the uh, aspects at least have a working knowledge 
and I apologize again in advance if folks in the room are already familiar with some of it, but I will try to keep it uh, relevant to, um, to, to everyone. Um, so uh, the federal uh, programs are listed here, and they are not an all-inclusive list, but this is just to sort of uh, uh, focus our attention on, on uh, where I would like to spend the next uh, 20 minutes or so on. Um, the federal government and CMS, as all of you, uh, all of us, I guess, know that uh, they have been involved in quality measurement for quite some time, um, uh, and they've been doing all sorts of programs. Um, this is sort of one way to slice it. Uh, you can break it down by the types of measurement they do for uh, facilities. Um, IQR and OQR, the inflation quality reporting and the outpatient quality reporting are pretty familiar to a lot of people. This, uh, the IQRs uh, and, and the OQR, the, the old Rick Dapu, and you know, in the CMS world, it's hard to avoid acronyms and <laughs> the alphabet soup. Um, and uh, on the ambulatory side, PQRI used to be uh, sort of what uh, was converted into the uh, uh, PQRS program. And now the payment model programs are the, the shared savings and the value-based purchasing type programs. And they all sort of are drawing from a lot of the measures that were in the old programs. And are, many of them are moving over into being utilized for these payment reform type programs. And new measures are being, being added. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the EHR incentive programs for both the eligible hospitals and critical access hospitals and the eligible professionals uh, are the latest programs which uh, require legislatively to report quality measures to those programs themselves. So the um, um, uh, folks at CMS are, uh, are aware of the fact that they have so many programs and um, they, there is a legislative mandate, actually, for CMS to consolidate the programs. And uh, they have been talking about alignment, which has come into even sharper focus uh, since the uh, uh, EHR incentive programs have come on board, because the electronic quality measurement uh, that is part of those programs, um, they are trying to sort of link it to the inpatient quality reporting uh, program and there is an overlap, yet the two have different ways of doing it. And so some of those differences and, and similarities I, I will mention, but their stated mission is to try to move as many of the measurement as possible from these other programs over to the electronic uh, reporting. Uh, so that's sort of the stated goal. Um, and there are obviously many challenges uh, in that. Now, just to uh, mention a couple of important things, I know everybody is being focused on the money part of the EHR incentive program, but there are two critical aspects of it. Uh, one is that it was for the first time that there was a, um, a formal uh, certification regime that was implemented for quality measurement programs. So um, for any EHR to be able to report through meaningful use the quality measures, they have to be certified um, as a um, uh, product that has demonstrated at least a minimum level of uh, capability to do quality measurement. Um, the other piece is that the quality measurement that was an in integral part of meaningful use um, is being reported through what is referred to as attestation um, up until now which meant that you had to use a certified product, generate your values, and then go on to a CMS website and enter those numbers for the measures that you had selected. So in some ways, uh, the bar for performance itself was extremely low because, uh, again, by statute, they were not going to look at the performance of the measures, but just the technical capability of someone a provider, as in a hospital or a physician, to be able to incorporate a certified product that would generate the quality measures and that they would just simply fulfill the obligation through this program by doing that. But where they are going next is obviously where they want 
electronic reporting of the quality measures at the uh, patient level and uh, do file uploads and things like that. And so this is the latest uh, sort of, uh, I guess, uh, visibility on what the plans are. They, they had originally been somewhat more aggressive in how they wanted the quality uh, uh, data to be reported. Uh, they started a pilot project, and there weren't that many takers. Um, I believe we were the only vendor that submitted uh, in the first year of the pilot patient level um, uh, quality data for four hospitals, but since then not much has been submitted. But this is the notice for proposed rule that is currently in the 60-day comment period before it becomes the final rule. So there are two rules that are out there currently. One is the IPPS rule, which deals with the payment, but it also has a big component of <coughs> performance in it. And the EHR um, um, uh, notice uh, of proposal for the EHR incentive program side of it. Um, but this is what they're proposing that in 2015, um, the current reporting period for ECQMs is on a fiscal uh, for the hospitals. They are proposing that for both hospitals and uh, physicians that it would go on a calendar cycle to align with the IQR program. So I'm picking just the hospital side of it now in this slide. So in the 2015 reporting period, um, there would be a quarterly reporting because IQR is quarterly and uh, individual patient level data would be reported electronically. Um, there is an interesting twist to this that even though it aligns with IQR, uh, they are proposing that only three quarters of data be submitted. Um, and there are some reasons for it a little bit more technical in nature, but the idea here is that um, this data would be uh, along at least similar to the time frames that IQR would be. Now the measures that um, you would select uh, would be um, also used for IQR. In other words, if you reported 28 measures that are currently available on the inpatient side as electronic uh, uh, files, then you don't have to submit uh, comparable uh, IQR data on the abstracted side. So that's kind of how the alignment is uh, proposed in the rule if it becomes uh, final. Um, I'm sorry, that, is that for 15 or for 16? So this is for 15 uh, year reporting period, which starts January 1. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, the following year, uh, they are proposing that it become mandatory that uh, at least nine measures, uh, at, at least, I'm sorry, for the hospital, at least 16 measures across the uh, three national quality uh, strategy domains be reported for meeting requirement for both IQR and um, the uh, EHR incentive program. And so that would affect the payment year for fiscal 2018, starting October uh, of 2017, I guess. So they need at least some amount of time in between to do the, the payment adjustments. Uh, some of the other proposed changes, because uh, uh, this has to be sort of kept in sync with what is happening on the IQRs itself, um, many of the process measures are being proposed to be eliminated from reporting in the 2017 uh, payment year because they are felt to be topped out. Um, some of the measures were being uh, recommended to be removed because MAP recommended them. The the measure authoring, uh, the measure application partnership, sorry, I sh should get it right in front of Tom. Um, and uh, I think there was one measure, at least maybe two, that lost NQF endorsement because the, um, the uh, folks who uh, were the stewards just didn't uh, uh, go through maintenance because the NQF endorsement has a three-year maintenance cycle, so people have to keep maintaining it. There's a lot of interest in outcomes-based measures, and this is where I think uh, CMS, as far as I can tell, obviously I don't speak for them, but, but they are very 
interested in uh, using the EHR data for uh, either de novo measures or to take existing outcomes measures that are primarily claims type measures but can be risk adjusted using EHR data. Actually, uh, Yale is currently doing a project for CMS. Uh, uh, I am involved in that project as well where they are uh, taking uh, 23 data elements that are considered to be um, core clinical data elements and are using those to risk adjust AMI 30-day mortality rate. And that's an interesting project that's currently underway. Um, there is uh, also obviously some issues with uh, not enough data, small sample size, so they're also proposing to, for certain conditions and procedure-specific measures to increase the time period from one year to three years for the, for the baseline and the comparative, uh, comparative uh, data. And then, of course, the um, episode of uh, care cost measure is, is in there. So, um, so that's sort of the, uh, lots of this type of an alignment that is happening on the IQR itself. The nature of measures are changing, but they are also trying to move as much of it as possible over to the key measure side, whether it is the entire measure or at least partial measure for risk adjustment. Um, but I want to now sort of spend a little bit of time to give this group a crash course on e-measures themselves. And uh, uh, so this is, uh, there is actually no official standard definition of e-measures, as a matter of fact. Uh, if you even go to the NQF site, you will find it referenced in two, three different places, and the definition might be slightly different. Uh, but this is from the from the NQF glossary that says that uh, there are performance measures that have been developed for use in an EHR or other electronic system, and they pull needed uh, data to evaluate performance directly from the EHR. And so I think that uh, there is, again, some misconception out there already that if you take data from an EHR, it doesn't matter how you use the data for performance, that that's an e-measure. And so I think that is not quite accurate because uh, this is my sort of way of saying that uh, you couldn't say that uh, the electric car the only difference is that it uses a battery, right? Um, so there, there is an entire infrastructure that you have to create to have the electric car be operationalized for someone to actually own it. And it's the same true with the, uh, it's, it's the same thing with e-measures. There's an entire infrastructure that needs to be stood up uh, for this to work, and I will spend the next several minutes sort of trying to go over um, some, of, some of those differences um, between the traditional uh, measurement and uh, e-measurement as it is conceived. Uh, the one big difference is that the uh, charge goes directly into the, the car and you don't have an abstractor in the middle to always provide the fuel, which in this context is the EHR data so, or, or medical records data. So it was very appropriate. I actually try to carry this analogy even further uh, in the sense that uh, uh, the type of measurement actually also might be slightly different. And in stage one, the concept of retooling was the main um, idea that you could just take the existing measures and retool them as e-measures. Uh, e and uh, we have all sort of found out the hard way that some of it is possible and a lot of it is not possible, right? So um, in this context, for example, uh, miles per gallon would not be a good measure for the electric car. Uh, but perhaps the same concept would be charged per uh, miles per charge or something like that, which would be more relevant to that. They're both trying to get at the consumer is trying to get that same type of idea, but, but it would be slightly different. So there's another vocabulary that's sort of entering the, the, the space called re-engineering, which means that you are trying to uh, get at the same concept, but perhaps not exactly trying to replicate the, the sort of uh, paper-based or chart-based measure. 
So from the standpoint of the people who actually um, either are EHR vendors or um, implementers or even uh, front-end workers, there's a, there's a simpler sort of uh, workflow that is tied to the, the standards that are necessary. Since, since there is no human being in the middle, the whole thing has to run on standards and the, and the data has to be based on certain standards and it has to be consumed according to certain standards. So, so this is a simplified version of those standards. And the, the three that are most relevant in this context uh, is something called the HQMF, which is the Health Quality Measure Format. So this is the standard in which the specification of an e-measure has to be built. So if HSCRC decides that they want to build measures, you would have to crank out HQMF. Uh, that measure would have to be represented in the HQMF format, which is an HL7 uh, standard. The HQMF itself is based on something called the quality data model, which is a logical model that layers on top of EHR data. And it was developed uh, uh, by the NQF uh, um, several years ago, or convened by the NQF convened a panel to, to, to develop this. And uh, the third thing that is relevant in this is the uh, quality reporting uh, the uh, document architecture. So these are the quality reporting uh, architecture. This is the type of data that will be consumed by uh, people who are running the measures. So for example, you have patient data. Uh, the uh, measure specification will be used to collect that data, which is based on the quality data model. And then it's consumed by some sort of electronic quality measure application, whether it's a uh, engine that is built within an EHR or outside an EHR. But they will consume all of these standards and then generate the HQMF, uh, the QRDA category one and three uh, reports. Um, so this is uh, an example of a quality data model. Um, the idea, again, is standardization of concepts so that uh, in this context, uh, aspirin would be defined by a certain value set that's within a standard called Rx norm. And it's a medication. And you can have an attribute of that called administered. And so no matter which EHR stores this type of data in whichever format, it doesn't matter as long as it's mapped back to this, then the measure developer just has to reference these concepts into the measure specification. And so that's sort of the, the underpinning of this whole idea. Um, I already mentioned QRDA1 uh, is the uh, document that um, does uh, a uh, individual patient level data. The QRDA3 is the uh, uh, at the aggregate level. Um, this is an example of category one. Um, sorry, it's sort of small print. Uh, there's a uh, version of this that is supposed to be machine readable and a portion of it has to be human readable. Most humans don't consider that human readable, but <laughs> it says it's human readable. Uh, and this is the category three. This is sort of how it comes out. And then the category three, really, you can use that to generate your uh, scores on a dashboard if you so choose. So um, that was sort of the infrastructure that is a very basic infrastructure that people who are going to be delving into e-measures need to have some basic understanding. Now, if you go into the, the deeper infra infrastructure, which is if you want to get into developing the e-measures, uh, this is the sort of stuff that is part of that infrastructure, which, um, which uh, the version 1.0 was in place uh, when uh, stage one of meaningful use went into place. It was very, very skimpy. I mean, there was really no significant uh, standards that were in place. Uh, there was a specification called uh, HITSP TN906 for the hospitals, uh, which was sort of pseudocode. It was not even any kind of standard. Um, there was a tool that uh, has been built by the MITRE Corporation called uh, Cypress, which is used to do the certification testing. 
Uh, and this was pretty much the bare bones infrastructure along which the first level of uh, this activity took place. So CMS has had uh, several of these uh, Kaizen events around e-measures because e-measures were found to be the single most uh, difficult thing to accomplish within the Meaningful Use uh, uh, program. So I was fortunate enough to be part of this type of, you know, stickies on the wall kind of exercise. And uh, this is the new sort of infrastructure that has resulted from some of those efforts and from feedback through the various organizations like American Hospital Association and HIMSS and all of these organizations. So the advances that have resulted in this new infrastructure, and this is very important if you want to get into developing uh, measures that will be e-specified. So this is all meant for measure developers. Uh, there is something called the measure authoring tool that was developed by the National Quality Forum, but it is now owned by CMS. And uh, you can actually go into that and generate uh, HQMF by uh, selecting clauses and things like that. So you don't have to be a programmer to generate HQMF using the measure authoring tool. And I think the version 2.0 is now in place. Yes? I'm going to ask what's probably a very basic question, uh -huh. naive sure. question, um, but I can give more help me understand what you're saying. Sure. Um, back on the slides uh, where you think that um, um, the Category 1, single piece support Category 3, and what is consumed by, consumed by a quality reporting engine, is that within a facility's HR system, or is that one of the, um, kind of, what's called, a vendor? It, it, it could be either. Okay. It could be either. And the same for, is that the same for the Category 3? So, yes. So the, the engine would consume uh, the, so, the engine could actually consume anything. It could consume EHR data. It could transform that EHR data. But at a minimum, that engine should be able to generate uh, QRDA1 at the patient level that will be submitted as part of the submission to CMS or other entity at the patient level. And then it could also generate the scores, which would be the aggregate QRDA3. Now, Depending upon the entity that wants this data, they could ask for either the patient level data or they could ask for just the aggregate score. And if they know that this engine or this product is certified, at least there is a minimum level of uh, acceptance that they have gone through some kind of testing that generates the correct numbers based on, on the data. If I'm not certified, HR, do they have that quality report that's built in? Or does it require a, a, a software or a vendor? Right. So the vendors that have certified as complete EHRs are required to have the quality piece in it. However, there are some vendors, uh, like us, for instance, that we have a certified quality module, but we don't do full complete EHRs. So anyone who has a complete EHR would have this, by definition, in place. Sure. No, I think that's really the purpose of this presentation, really to, to sort of, you know, uh, give you some overline, you know. So then, uh, in this diagram, where does that uh, reporting engine sort of fit within the scope of what you're talking about? Is it within the scope of what you're talking about? Okay, so uh, in this one, for example, the eCQM application would be sort of that calculation engine and generating the QRDA file, it would have to be able to read some part of that HQMF specification. So the idea is that this engine takes in EHR data, it takes in the HQMF specification, and it matches those up to generate those QRDA1 files as well as the QRDA3 calculations. Now, this engine could be given a QRDA1 file that may have been generated from an EHR, and it could import that file. So in other words, if this is a standalone, let's say an HSCRC engine, you could get a QRDA1 file from the different EHRs that can generate that and consume it and generate your QRDA3 values based on the measure that you're looking at. That help? Okay. Sure.
And so the pieces that I was showing that are new in this are the uh, this uh, Bonnie tool that has come up uh, because uh, there was a need to generate test cases. That is one of the problems measure developers were having. They didn't have enough test cases. So this tool actually can generate test cases that can be used uh, in the measure authoring tool and in the Cypress tool. So the measure authoring tool really is to generate your HQMF specifications, whereas the Cypress is to test the HQMF that you have generated. And the Bonnie tool generates the test cases for you to test those specifications. <laughs> so I mean, those are test cases. How about the auditing of the data? Would would we still need to go in and do That's kind of going back to the origin? That's EHR? an excellent question. Actually, this has been one of the biggest challenges in terms of the field audit. Um, so the test cases are good to at least uh, know that your clauses are having using the correct logic because you have to use the logic and so forth. The problem was that when they first created the test cases, they created cases, uh, they wanted to keep the number of cases small, so they didn't create cases that represented uh, the real world. It just gave them the logic. So for example, someone had multiple hysterectomies. And when it went into the field, and some of that logic sort of conflicted with people who were, who were doing some data validation on their own data. So um, right now there's an effort uh, underway at CMS to generate a, um, a, a test case generator that generates a larger number of test cases but keeps some of those uh, referential integrity. But I believe your question was more, how do you validate in the field? And so uh, CMS uh, in this proposed rule has uh, proposed that in 2015, when it will still be voluntary to report electronically, uh, that they will be doing a validation test with 100 hospitals around the country, where uh, the old CDAC group that does the, the validation for the IQR is charged with uh, uh, whichever these 100 hospitals that sign up. They actually CMS is proposing to pay the hospitals for their time and effort and they will connect with some sort of software that they will be installing. And the CDEC abstractors will go in and take a sample of cases that have been submitted electronically and see whether they are correctly uh, doing uh, the, the correct thing. In our case, since we also do uh, Oryx vendor uh, sort of uh, core measure reporting, we actually can compare their e-measures to their uh, to core measures in the same data set. Uh, so there's, uh, uh, we actually were a subcontractor in a study that we did for CMS around that issue. But I think that is what everybody wants to know ahead of time before this either becomes mandatory or becomes a big part of public reporting or becomes used in, uh, so uh, I think the transition is definitely going to be uh, quite a bit of a work and challenge. And in thinking about collecting those 100 hospitals, I would imagine that it's probably more relevant to have all the EMR vendors represented than 100 hospitals because sure. the logic is going to be conditioned on how sure. the data are stored in the vendor system. Sure, yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and it's actually not even a single vendor issue. It's the vendor's implementation. Right. <laughs> how they configure it. How exactly. they configure right. in a space. Uh, so no, you're absolutely correct, and uh, I think NQF has done some work in that regard. Um, CMS has also now asked the measure developers uh, to uh, pay a lot of attention to feasibility of e-measures that they are going to be developing, the new e-measures that they're going to be developing. And, and there are some criteria, and, and one of them is that it should be at least more than X number of implementations across uh, certain minimum number of EHRs uh, before it is considered technically feasible to do it. Um, and so, uh, yes, yeah, so there's a lot of work that is being done, but a lot obviously needs to be done. And so, um, so these are some of the issues that we're dealing with. I think I, I mentioned the data capture feasibility. You've got the EHR capability, I think, which Peter was referring to. Uh, 
provider adoption and readiness, workflow variations, um, because ideally the concept of e-measures is that you capture this data once as part of your workflow and the use of quality measures is secondary to it. That in some cases implies that you're going to have to change the workflow. And uh, places where we find the biggest pushback from clinicians is where, where people are just adding more screens to capture the same data, but now for quality measures. And providers are saying, well, you know. And in general, the biggest problem in this, and uh, uh, I'm sure there are lots of problems, but the biggest problem in this data capture, especially for e-measures, is the fact that most EHRs don't handle the fact that somebody decided not to do something as well from a data capture standpoint. So for e-measures, you have to actually say that you wanted to do it, but you didn't do it. They capture all things that you have done fairly well, and if it's not captured in a codified format, you can always connect it. Um, to a code, you can map to a code. But the EHR doesn't handle the fact that someone said, oh, I wanted to give aspirin, but I didn't give aspirin in a very structured, codified workflows type of way. They might mention it in some note somewhere, in pretext or whatever, but to embed that in every workflow is one of the challenges of this change. So not giving the aspirin, is this when the clinician should have made an exception because of some other Yes, so it gets factor. into, right, so, so the way that case gets treated is very different as to how that data gets captured. So uh, if the, the computer can't tell the difference between null and not given, <laughs> because it, it sees nothing was there, so it assumes that it wasn't done, but there may have been a good reason why it wasn't done, okay. and that reason, although it is codified, all these measure specifications will have reasons attached for not doing something, so-called negation reasons. But it's very hard to build that into every workflow of a clinician to capture that in a codified, structured way that it can be used um, consistently because that doesn't normally get worked into a workflow. So you can actually embed a certain workflow uh, especially in like uh, CPOE in the physician uh, computerized physician order entry systems, you can put in decision support if you know that this patient has a stroke or an AMI. You can generate certain orders that they would have to select from. But if they uncheck some order, typically it's harder for the system to actually then, you know, spring up a box that says, "Why are you not doing this?" and capture it codified because the patient may have had an allergy or the patient may have had GI bleeding in the past. So all of that, co all those codes, reason codes have to then be selected. That's where it gets somewhat tedious and, and, and uh, providers usually have uh, issues. Um, the other big issue is that in the typical standard uh, logic of, e of general measures, it's very easy to see where a measure failed because it's very hierarchical, algorithmic. With e-measures, when you apply the whole code, um, it, it applies everything at the same time. Uh, in other words, the, the entire code gets applied to the data at the same time. So to identify as an end user where the measure failed, because that's the next question people ask, okay, so I did not meet this numerator, why? And so typically then you have to sort of go down to some sort of schemes like this where you have to provide the entire HQMF logic in a more graphical format that can tell people at what level the, me the, the measure may have failed. Um, so this is sort of some of the, the techniques people are using. Uh, risk adjustment currently in the e-measures world is uh, not handled really well because the logic is still not as well developed to, to uh, by itself. The new HQMF that is a uh, uh, release 2.x uh, currently in a draft uh, standard for trial use uh, has some risk adjustment um, capability in it. And uh, this is sort of the latest iteration of potentially how the infrastructure might change even more because ONC is uh, very focused on um, 
clinical decision support and outcomes in stage three. So they are now sort of getting ready for stage three and someone raised the question that the people on the clinical decision support side have different standards and the quality measure people have different standards. So ONC is now trying to harmonize them uh, through something called the uh, clinical quality framework, uh, which is shown up here on the left side. So I'm showing you the quality data model on the quality side and on the clinical decision support side, they were using something called virtual medical record, which was the equivalent of the quality data model. These are all logical models that they use to do their uh, clinical decision support uh, artifacts, uh, which is the equivalent of the HQMF specification. And so they are trying to harmonize these two um, with this thing called the uh, clinical quality format and the two other standards that are uh, in, coming into play, FIRE and QUIC, are the two additional standards that are being, um, so it's, it's a very complicated kind of thing, but m most people don't have to deal with it. I think uh, measure developers really have to deal with it. Uh, people who are doing research in this type of area have to deal with it. Um, and uh, certainly the standards organizations have to deal with it, and the, and the government obviously is, is interested in pushing the standards to, um, to the next. And so my, I'm sorry I went a little over, but my final slide is uh, where I think uh, these are a few of the things that perhaps the commission should at least uh, uh, potentially consider or at least keep an eye on it uh, in terms of the uh, uh, the alignment uh, with the stay uh, with the with, with CMS and now actually because there is a state component of meaningful use, uh, I was in Michigan a couple of weeks ago uh, giving a presentation, and the state of Michigan is requiring for its Medicaid uh, meaningful use program to submit QRDA one files starting July one of this year. So some states are beginning to sort of require. Uh, submission of the patient data files as opposed to just doing attestation for at least the Medicaid. So there will be some kind of, I guess, overlap and alignment between CMS and state. Um, the infrastructure, I think we've already discussed. Uh, and, and the final point is really that no matter how much this infrastructure gets developed and a good portion of measurement might be done through these, and there's a lot of excitement that the risk adjustment will be rich, richer with EHR data as opposed to just you know conditions from a uh, claim form or something like that. It still will not replace some of those other things. And I finally come back to my analogy that no matter how good Tesla gets, I don't think all of us will be driving electric cars in you know five years from now. There will be a lot more people driving a lot of electric cars, but I think the other cars will still be there. So I think uh, multi-modality sort of frameworks that incorporate both e-measures as well as other types of measurement, um, I think uh, would probably be um, the norm, I would think, than one thing replacing the other. With that, I, I truly appreciate uh, this time and uh, certainly um, very excited as a, as a lifelong Maryland resident in what Maryland is doing. Whenever I'm at any conference, I say, you know what Maryland is doing? <laughs> and so um, uh, I, I applaud all of your uh, work and, and uh, anything we can do to pitch in. questions or any other comments? So in your, uh, I mean, this was real helpful. Thank you. And I think most of us are really hearing bits and pieces, but really don't see the extent of the developments on that side. Sure. So you mentioned the risk, you know, the enriched risk adjustment models combining administrative sure. data and EHR. Sure. In your framework, where did that happen? I think what you're presenting is still the EHR-based measure development. Where would you, would you put the claims back into the EHR system, or is it more feasible to take the EHRs out? That's an excellent question. So what is being developed 
under that GL project is not HQMF or an e-measure, but they want to use data elements that would be considered as core data elements as part of meaningful use uh, that they could use instead of the comorbid condition. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the types of data that they're looking at on admission are vital signs, some of the lab results, and they feel that if they add those as uh, sort of risk adjusters in addition to the comorbid conditions that it would inc increase the fidelity of the risk uh, of that patient on admission. That's why they're trying to do it on admission, even though the measure itself is not per se an e-measure. So the, the data they are trying to use for the risk adjustment is part of the meaningful use measure set. Mm -hmm. In terms of the, the data validation where you compare the Oryx extracted data with the e-measures, how did that go? Are you allowed to share? No. <laughs> okay. CMS actually controls that. Yes. And okay. so. I'll say, I don't know how that went, but I'll say knowing from hospitals around the country um, that um, there was a lot of consternation about the, the uh, comparability and how how the two types of measures match up or really how they don't match up. Yeah, there, there are lots of uh, specification issues. I mean, the I, and so now I'm not talking about the study, but yes, uh, sure. uh, so just a subtle nuance in um, the specification can make a huge difference. Um, so for example, something as simple as the, the concept of an inpatient um, admission start date time. For a human being, you know, it's easy. But for a computer, it gets very complicated. Because what, it, what is that date time? Is that the one that the registration um, was done? Is that the one that the registration was done, but somebody had to pick a date time stamp that specifically specified that this encounter starts now? Now, that is different from patient arrival and departure. So you have two of these things that are running parallel, yet they are sort of, you know, touching each other. A human being can navigate those nuances by reading the chart and saying, you know, this thing happened that time. But, but here it has to be precise. It's just very unforgiving. So if you are off by a little bit, it's just going to throw that entire uh, denominator set off. But I think we will definitely, um, I think, get to the point where it is, at least for the measures that are accepted to be good e-measures, I think it will be, but it, it'll be a, a, a somewhat of a difficult road. So, Saeed, thanks for taking a very complex topic and being our translator today, and uh, also for that um, injection of realism about where we are and uh, where we're headed, but, but what it's going to take to get there. And along those lines, as we think about staying aligned with CMS, keeping up, um, also understanding that it'll continue to be multi-modality and that we've got uh, a ways to go and it's going to take a while to bring these standards together and really develop the infrastructure, it takes me to that middle point on your takeaway slide here, which is um, the idea of developing and partnering uh, to get to this infrastructure. What would you recommend, seeing this big picture on the data side, knowing what you know about performance measurement, what would you recommend to us uh, in terms of who should do what when, um, and maybe um, uh, most um, usefully, like, What's next? What's, what's, what are the very next things we should be thinking about and, and doing, um, given all of the uh, leverage in this room? So I think, Tom, uh, the, the most important thing would be to um, keep an eye on uh, the standardized data that's going to come out of EHRs and how you could use it, whether you could use the data in your risk adjustment of your non-e-measures, or if you could take some of the data and generate your own 
um, uh, results for the e-measures that have been vetted and that have become now the normal submission for CMS, you, you, you probably don't want to be in a position where you want the hospital to submit to you abstracted measures for which they are already submitting QRDA1 files to CMS. Because then they'll say, well, why, why do I have to continue to abstract? Now that the validation is done, I'm, my hospital compare is showing my e-measures. And so to the state, I have to now still submit the old abstracted data. So now that may not be an issue if you're not getting patient level data. But my guess is that you would want to position yourself to get a lot of patient level data if you want to do a lot of population health and so forth. Because you could say to them, just give me your aggregate results. And this way, at least you will have their performance, but you still wouldn't have sort of some of the rich data that eventually I think would be important. So uh, being prepared to use what emerges, yes. um, which um, I think is very important. And, and there's some, there's an active component to that, but it's primarily reactive to what the system is going to be able to produce. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that the commission or the hospitals or other players should be actively doing to push forward to make the data more available? So I think the hospitals are already on, on their course. Um, most of them, I think, um, and Maryland has a lot of e EHR implementations. and. So most of them are already uh, doing various stages of, um, of the meaningful use. And part of that is generating these files. And part of it will be going forward submitting those same files to CMS. Uh, I think the, the, the more important thing is that, that the commission sort of needs to determine its overall approach to getting clinical data and what it wants to do with it uh, in terms of uh, performance measurement that would be multimodality and statewide. So those we, I, I think uh, 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 once we're beyond this point, then, and I know ONC is getting beat up by Congress on interoperability. And interoperability of the quality data is, is definitely part of it. And so there will be a lot of push between now and the end of stage three to focus on interoperability as well as outcomes uh, and clinical decision support. So those are the three main things. I think if you heard uh, Karen DeSalvo's comments as she became the uh, head of ONC, she said they're going to be laser focused on interoperability over the next, and I think it's, it's primarily because they want to, you know, that was always been part of their plan, but I think uh, Congress is it, it, it's around that time that Congress becomes a little restless about what do we get for our money sort of thing. And, and for them, the interoperability is high on the list. And this falls within that because if, if different hospitals' EHRs are generating these CCD files or QRDA1 files and they can be moved around, then it opens up that sort of uh, data interchange, which I think uh, in this context would be getting patient data to run your performance measures, whether they are e-measures or e-data enhanced other measures for risk adjustment and things like that. I have another question. Sure. So that comment I was already thinking, but it's relevant. In terms of outcome measures, mm -hmm. it seems to me the EHR measures or the systems are still collecting more of the process type measure and, and that way. So how do you see, is it going to be the next generation of EHR or are there still things there that could leave us with more outcome based type of measurement? So I, I think that the outcomes uh, where I personally, this is my personal opinion, I think where the, e uh, where the electronic data, not necessarily the e-measure itself, but the electronic data that's already now codified and standardized, the place where it will have a big impact in outcomes is going to be the outcomes measures that need to be risk adjusted. And I think that the EHR enriched data will be a, a um, I shouldn't say 
better, but it'll be an improvement on the risk adjustment mm -hmm. methodologies that we currently have, which is primarily based on a few demographic factors and mostly uh, folks' comorbid conditions and, and their age and, and some of those factors. But I think that when you add, for example, you know, some of their lab tests, some of their vital signs, and, and some additional components which are structured and codified, um, then I think you potentially could enhance the, the power of your risk adjustment. And also the, the idea that some really important outcome measures require multiple pieces of information over time, like right. functional status, for example. Right. Well, I mean, also you, uh, in general, I mean, you know, if you're getting vital signs or lab data, uh, you'll probably not get into this issue of whether the coding was correct or not. In, you know, risk, in risk adjustment, that's sort of the, the, the big, I, I was at the ACO, they had a, uh, at the ACO summit in the pre-conference, they had this whole section on the, the problems with risk adjustment. Actually, I heard a nice joke, they said, uh, three statisticians uh, went uh, hunting, and uh, one shot and missed the deer to the right by a wide margin. The other shot and missed the deer to the left by a wide margin, and a third was jumping up and down and said, we got him. <laughs> Great uh, presentation. A uh, couple questions for you, if you could. One is, what's uh, being done about, because that point you made that we don't document something that wasn't done yeah. is a huge uh, issue. We're pulling data out of the EMR to give displays of compliance with like about five different bundles. And the data alone is, is because they're off floor, there's things, in, and the only way we found to get more accurate data is that staff could annotate to feed back in to say, no, no, don't code it as this because it, it's, um, without that, the data would be very, very noisy. And then the, the second question is, given that we are going to be living in this multimodality, which is no doubt true, and the performance of each modality varies widely. Are there any efforts, or maybe it's even a state question, to create some standards for what might be accurate enough to be used? Because if you know the the concern is there, they're going to be at much different levels, and without some either guiding principles or rules to say when you can use something, it might be quite confusing for many it, stakeholders. It, it's actually it's actually an excellent question, and and as a matter of fact, uh, I have had that conversation at the NPF level, and and uh, I chair the HIMS Performance Measurement Task Force, and we're currently in the comment period of trying to give comments on the IPPS and the EHR and Senate rules. But the issue really, be, I mean, that you, you really um, uh, nailed it, uh, especially as it pertains to public reporting, because um, the concept on the original retooling was that you had a measure which had an NQF number, and it was specified according to whatever specification, and let's say it was an abstracted measure that somebody was abstracting. And now the uh, steward actually creates a e-specification of the same measure, which is the so-called retooling, which the original assumption was that it would completely replicate that measure. And so to the consumer, it wouldn't matter how it got there. But we all know that that's not going to happen, right? So what CMS is currently proposing, actually, in the proposed rule, the only thing they're proposing is um, they initially had proposed last year that maybe public reporting of this data that's submitted electronically should not happen until the validation is complete. In this proposed rule, they say because of uh, a lot of comments that were against this, they are now going to put this data um, starting 2015 on the website with a notation at the bottom, a footnote as they call it, that will say this data was submitted electronically. And I have a real sort of issue with that because it's hard enough for consumers to go on what is there now and figure things out 
and for them to make a distinction between hospital A submitting data for four quarters abstracted and hospital B submitting three quarters of data for the same AMI, whatever, you know, eight or uh, whatever that process measure is, it's very difficult for a consumer to m make a difference between those nuances. My, my guess, Peter, is that they will just have to somehow separate these things out and, and sort of say that you know, e-measures are really different from other measures. And, and so at least the e-measure to e-measure comparison would be comparable as opposed to comparing an e-measure to an abstracted measure. I think that would be more problematic. But you are correct that this whole data validation really is, uh, and, and at some point it, it, it'll have to involve, uh, you know, the, the, the statisticians and data scientists to, to do all those statistics to show that in large numbers the concept is being addressed in different ways. But you can't compare this way to that way, right? You will have, so, so the uh, idea when, when it was felt that perhaps retooling was not as viable a concept as they thought it might have been, this whole idea of so-called de novo measures came up. And then somebody said, well, what do you mean by de novo measures? Does it mean that a, a new concept has to be developed? And does that mean that the 900 measures that are already endorsed uh, suddenly lose relevance? Or do you mean that uh, you know, the same concept is there, but you have it doing it in a different way. And so that's where this terminology of re-engineering is now creeping in, that if the concept is the same, but you are now re-engineering the, the, the measure to be done slightly differently. But it hasn't really been officially endorsed. But that's a very complicated issue, especially on the public reporting side. In the public reporting and then the pay side, because if performance varies by how you right. collect it, and many of these payment systems are ranked order, right. you could get into a, a very confusing situation. Absolutely. Yep. Any, any other comments? In terms of the scale, if the hospital is moving to e-measures, mm -hmm. are they doing all of them, or is it going to be? That, that, that's a good point. So, um, so currently, there are 29 um, e-measures on the hospital side. And there are 64 on the physician side. And the 29, actually, one of the ED measures is an outpatient measure. so. You really, if you are talking about inpatient only, you're down to 28. Now that still leaves a little bit of a gap in what people have to report as abstracted measures for IQR. But if they go through the pruning process of removing a lot of the process measures because they either were topped out or whatever in 2017, by the time these things come together, you may be able to fill the gap just with what you have. And I know that there are at least three or four other measures that I know of that are under development, which will come out of the pipeline um, in, in the next year or so. So there might be more, more e-measures that get developed. Some of the existing abstracted measures might go away. So that's how the gap might be narrowed. Now, in IQR and in value-based purchasing, there are way more measures than this, but many of them don't require additional data submissions, so they are either through claims, you know, mm -hmm. most of the hack measures and those things you don't, and even the ARC measures you don't need any submission. And do you see development more on the inpatient side or outpatient side? Um, there, there is more on the inpatient side right now. The uh, ambulatory side, I think uh, the 64 are very heavily tilted towards uh, primary care. Um, the specialists have been complaining for a long time that they don't have enough measures. The problem with that is that you know their, their own um, societies or whoever would uh, sort of spearhead those types of efforts either have registries that are really silos. I mean, they don't even do good regular measures, uh, some of them, uh, I should. <laughs> Isn't to add, um, but uh, I think that uh, 
the, the, the specialty societies are now really engaged, as a matter of fact. I know my own specialty, GI, uh, they, they are really engaged in trying to now sort of really get involved in, because everybody has been sort of a little bit uh, wait and see mode, but now I think everybody's uh, sensing that this pay for performance thing is going to happen, and, and I think the societies are, are engaged now, so maybe they will um, uh, get together groups of physicians mm -hmm. to develop specialty measures. Um, but the primary care measures are represented fairly well in those 64 measures that are currently available. Okay. In our next agenda item, we're going to be talking about patient-centered measurement. Where does patient-reported information fit into e-measures infrastructure? Uh, ex another out? excellent question that's sort of high on the you know, government's list as well. So the current state there is that there is big debate about what to do with patient-generated um, data. How do you integrate it within an EHR? And there's a lot of sort of ideas. Uh, the, the concerns that some providers are s sort of showing is that how do they validate the data if it ends up in their EHR that was imported from a PHR. And so I think that discussion is very sort of basic right now. It's, it's um, the discussion in the provider side has moved on from just data capture to what do we do with this data, how do we do it accurately, how do we do it well with that uh, patient reported outcome. Um, the issue currently is how do we even integrate these two data sources uh, in, a, in a way that um, everybody can feel comfortable with it, uh, how does it get edited, who owns it. So all those types of questions are being raised. Um, I think they're going to have to figure that out first before it kind of moves uh, into the, the quality realm um, as, a, as a good data source. But I do know that, especially for functional measures and so forth, there is great interest in trying to collect the data from the patient directly. Did anyone ask while well, I was out about what you see in your crystal ball about when um, this is there's broad use of e measures under the category of everything takes longer than it takes? Like, is there a, is there a strategic timing goal that CMS has in mind that you have insight into, or what's your real opinion about? The, well, they would they would they would like this to be mandatory in 2017. So, um, I mean, in the in the 2016 sort of performance period. Um, so that's their current goal. If, if it gets finalized in the, in the um, proposed rule, but that's kind of, but, but you know, they had wanted that to happen this year. Yeah, and uh, you know the ICD-10. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so the ICD-10 is going to bump into that whole thing, yeah. That will make our risk adjustment. <laughs> Well, that would still be on the claim side, though. It's, it's harder to fudge the EHR data than, well, I shouldn't use the word fudge, but, but to, to get it accurate. Okay. okay. I hope that was helpful. It was. It was yeah. extremely helpful and insightful, and I did not understand even half of what you said, but the other <laughs> part of what I did really good <laughs> and um, it at least gives us the words that you know gets us familiar and sure clearly some of us actually knew what you were saying um, what I would highly appreciate is like a um, there's a lot of acronyms sure. in here what each thing can, actually means I like if, send, we, if sure. we can put it in a slide in the back sure. I think it would be very we'll easy. Be glad to do that. thank you yes. thank you again I truly appreciate it and, and just forgot is anyone on the phone want to uh, ask any questions or chime in at this juncture. Okay. All right. So uh, we're going to the next agenda item, which is um, I attempted to put together a sort of what we're calling more of our um, final report. And I use a term um, sort of aspirational, as, you know, about population-based patient-centered measures and and them, I think, the new frontier of measures where 
Um, we do not uh, really have um, a, a wide array of measures uh, to choose from. Um, there, there will be some, some of them will be developmental uh, and will certainly coincide with what's happening in the larger context. But um, in the beginning of the report, uh, you'll see this, what I call the short-term, Ed, to your question earlier, 2014, and then the midterm sort of overlaps with the long-term. Um, so uh, this is, you know, how, how are we going to move forward with performance measurement development and implementation in these, in, in these sort of chunks of time? Um, <clears throat> so we, I also try to, again, focus on the new measurement areas, patient-centered uh, measures and then um, population-based measures. Um, the, on page three, we go through, you know, the need to identify uh, for what purposes, accountability, improvement, alignment with the various targets and uh, uh, statewide model um, requirements, and then what stakeholders these measures need to um, provide data for or, or whom is the audience. And those are the policy makers and um, oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the providers, payers, purchasers, and patients and consumers. Um, and um, we have the three part aim as central to our um, to our whole model. And we also have to then um, identify priorities that line up with those. And I think you mentioned the national quality strategy, and Tom has mentioned them in his slides. But there, there are um, several of those priorities, health and well-being, uh, prevention and treatment of bleeding cause of mortality, person and family center care that's squarely in uh, one of its own priority here, uh, where, where we have a gap um, or not a lot being done that we, we really need to address, and then effective communication um, and care coordination. The ones, um, health and well-being, I think, speak to more population health uh, measurement issues. Uh, I think we may be better uh, situated on prevention and treatment, patient safety, and affordable care. Well, that's something we're always ongoing. And then um, I, it was interesting to me, and I thought we needed to include them in here, is the national quality strategy levers, um, because these really will be important uh, uh, tools for us to uh, implement this broad picture of measurement. And again, we are already using several of these, uh, and we're trying to do better at using uh, some of these more so. And that measurement and feedback, we, have, uh, we provide a plethora of reports to hospitals on what currently is being uh, the, what their current performance is, and uh, we would plan to continue to do that and more so. Um, and there's uh, lots of public reporting, um, which will definitely expand as we expand in the, these new measurement areas. Um, learning and technical assistance, um, we, we have made efforts along those lines and work with partners like MHA and uh, MHEI and others. Um, certification, accreditation, regulation. Well, we're all good on regulation. We know that. Um, and then a consumer incentives and benefit design. We, you know, we, don't, uh, we don't directly have that lever, but we could figure out maybe how we should um, work with partners on that lever. And then payment, that's obvious. And then health information technology. Thank you, Dr. Budd, for filling us in on, on that. And then innovation and diffusion. And I think the model as it's designed with global uh, with global budgets, et cetera, it, it was explicitly uh, noted that it, we wanted to encourage innovation and uh, diffusion. And then we do, at the commission, have um, opportunities, and we do take them um, in terms of workforce development with our, for example, nurse support programs. We have NSP1 and NSP2 um, here. And we would imagine, hope we'd consider to do, we continue to do programs uh, similar to those, or or the same as those going forward. Um, so, in terms of the work that sort of has been done, I just try to highlight what the main accomplishments of the work group is, which which were to uh, vet that vet and get these readmission and MHAC updated policies through the 
through the commission and approved. And then uh, next, we tried to get this dashboard put in place. And I think that the group has come to some agreement about um, that the measures on there are, are what we're comfortable with for now, as long as we understand who the audience is, et cetera. And then, um, uh, so these new frontiers are then uh, come to this population health and patient-centered care measures. And then in the next two sections, we, we review some of the uh, inputs uh, to the and presentations that Tom did for the group and examples of these uh, different sorts of measures um, with population health having uh, several subdomains here. Um, and then um, with um, their, you know, us needing to think about as we continue to do the performance measurement work, how we would phase in um, these um, uh, more uh, more broad and uh, uh, more broad-based population health measurements. And in that uh, paragraph on page six, underneath the graphic um, that has the overlap between population health and the hospital measurement, uh, phasing uh, the work group discussed first measuring healthy behaviors, preventative services for hospitals, then expanding to assessing community health needs and developing um, a measurement strategy around improvement, and then finally collaborating with public health officials and community services um, on measuring progress and addressing community needs. So in, in this area, if there's additional thinking, and certainly all the report is open, the draft for comment, but how we might think about phasing, if there are other ideas around that, I, I would greatly appreciate them. We'll be on the same uh, time frame in terms of getting comments back by the end of June so that we can um, have this as an informational report to the commission. Um, the next section is uh, patient-centered care measures. And again, um, Dr. Budd uh, touched upon some that we would like to get at eventually in our uh, probably longer term timeline, which is uh, around functional status, for instance. But early on, you know, we, we have HCAPs and that's what we use. And then so we, we would um, continue to do phasing in of those types of measures. And then um, finally, there's just some next steps, um, which again sort of reiterates um, uh, kind of what we've done, but mainly identifies what we want to do going forward, which is to work with subgroups um, and ad hoc groups and other uh, multi-agency groups um, that, that work on these things by topic and, and also continue the work of the performance measurement work group with, uh, with a lot of collaboration and inputs from these various subgroups and, and uh, multi-agency groups. Um, and then um, we just sketched out finally in Appendix B the um, measurement areas and domains, and then we put a timeline there. Uh, we re reviewed this at an earlier meeting, and we put the various audiences and purposes for measurement and how we would like to progress over time. Um, and that's just sort of an example of uh, what we'd like to do. So that, that's the report in a nutshell, and I don't know if anyone had, you know, it was just sent out yesterday, so I'm, I'm appreciative of the fact that People would not have had an, any time to really review it, but um, if there is uh, are any um, thoughts that you have now around, you know, what anything that we may have missed that we should address in this report, um, or that um, we should expand upon, or that there's too much of anything like that. How long do we have for comments? Um, until the end of June. So same as the yeah. other report. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we will be been talking about the joint like collaborative accountability. Um, we may have some sections more in terms of, and I think consume, there was a white paper from the Maryland Healthcare All uh, Coalition um, urging HCRC to think about regional improvement goals, regional accountability, and, and kind of incorporate them into the payment structure. And it also came from our discussion, too, I remember in multiple meetings, um, the idea that, um, you know, for Baltimore City hospitals, for example, um, certainly their primary service areas are overlapping and think about those ways. So when you think about 
population health measures and patient-centered outcome measures, you know, there might be work in areas that we can do to do a hospital-specific measure versus a more um, still a regional-based measure and hold multiple hospitals accountable from it. And I apologize because it's my first one, but two things to consider, you know, in terms of patient-centered care or value, we, I wonder if we might all consider defining value from the payer and from the patient perspective. Because for the patient, and as the largest growth is in out-of-pocket expenses, what they often care about is what am I paying and, and you know, putting together some of that might be quite informative for a, really for a patient-centered measure as opposed to what an employer or a payer is, is doing. And the second, um, and uh, Maryland, I think, could really lead is potentially exploring a composite numerator for a value measure of quality. I mean, that, that, in other words, we have patient experience measures, we have process measures, we have some outcome measures, we have some quality of life, but it, consumers are getting so overwhelmed that, you know, they're not going to look but potentially saying, might we integrate those? And we, and we would have to decide on the weights, you know, how would you give age caps versus, but there's method, I mean, Tom has done that, there's, we've done that for the LeapFrog safety scorecard, regardless of what you think about it, there's, there's ways to weight things to come up with a, uh, something that the, the underlying data could still be there to make it easier for consumers to, to, to get a better picture. Thank you. Um, just one comment. I think um, you had several su good suggestions. The only caution and concern I have for any composite score is that when the score is not optimal and a patient sees there's room for opportunity, if the drill down were available to yeah. see what, of course, attributes to the score as opposed to um, just having guesswork. We, we can't take conversation with infections and try to pull all the different infections, whether it's FLAP, C, SSI, and then be able to drill down to the detail. But sometimes, as you said, the consumer wants just that one metric that they can go in and see the other. So. And, and no, I mean, ex, ex, mm, not explicitly, but we do weigh in our payment programs by the percentage risk. In, in the QBR, we have some, but I think... Um, in a more thoughtful and structured way would probably help a lot in terms of the, you know, right now, for example, our QBR program is at 1%. It has clinical measures, age caps, and mortality with different weights, which we kind of collaboratively decide on. And the MHAC is 4%. So clearly, we, we grade the uh, complications much, much higher. And again, that's fine, but we it's interesting in the hospital setting we're getting more and more very specific questions as patients become a little bit more astute in reading newspaper and other articles. So they want to know what's the infection rate of my doc if I'm going to have an orthopedic procedure. So again, I think that's fine and I agree it's worked fairly well with some of the scores that we are using now. Uh, as long as it's considered directional data and there's also instruction and guideline as to how to use a drill down. Mm -hmm. And uh, the hospital guide has had some experience with that as well. You, to your point, because you already are doing this for, for many things, the other challenge besides how you weight the components is what do you index it against, right? So I would imagine consumers are going to want perfect care. I mean, it, everyone would be held against it, but they probably care less about relative and saying, you know, whether it's, you know, 100% on each caps or process measures or no infections relative to that. So we, we'd have to think through how do you benchmark it. Right, because they will simply look for who has the highest score. I think the, uh, the consumers uh, tend to, again, um, obviously, um, I'm just basing this on some discussions that I've uh, either had or, or was part of uh, when the NQF 
was convening certain groups, and there's always a consumer representative of some sort, and the comments that they make generally fall into sort of two groups. I think uh, they have less trouble with outcomes type measures. They understand those that, you know, whether it's an infection rate or some kind of outcome, whether it's functional or mortality or something. They have a, a much uh, a more difficult time with process measures, and the more granular and the more in number they are, they get totally confused because there's no context for them. And so the question in my mind is always that how important is it to put too many process measures for consumers to look at? I think personally that outcome measures are important for every stakeholder, including the providers and everything. But perhaps the providers should be really focusing on a lot more on process measures because that's how they can improve the outcome, right? So there is always this debate that even at the NQF, I know uh, when uh, Chris Castle actually started canvassing the NQF members, she said the first thing I noticed is that half of them said we have too many measures and the other half say we don't have enough. <laughs> so. I think if we try to do one size fits all for consumer, for payer, and for providers, I think we're going to get very, it, it becomes very difficult because they each have different needs and perspectives. So I use my auto, my, my auto analogy again. So my guess is that on a Toyota assembly line, you have hundreds of process measures that they measure. None of them we ever see, but I'm sure that J.D. Powers just puts out four or five that a customer can easily decide which car they want. And we need to have a similar framework, I think, in healthcare where, where, where a customer really can, consumer can really just quickly look at something and make some judgments about which physician or hospital they want to see or is it okay to see. But I think when you get down to the provider level, and many of those process measures might be different for different hospitals. They don't even have to be endorsed, potentially, by a national consensus organization. Because by its very nature, the process of taking a guideline, which typically a lot of the process measures are basically or guideline driven. So if you take a change in, you know, not even coming up with new uh, measures, but if you take an existing process measure, by the time that guideline is reflecting the change in scientific evidence and it gets reflected in the consensus guideline and that consensus guideline gets into the endorsement pipeline and goes through the endorsement cycle and then gets into a program, I mean, by definition, that's a long lead time and so I think that when uh, those types of measures get into a pay for performance program, it's very difficult sometimes to move the ocean liner when the evidence either changes. Because at the conference, there were two or three physicians who made this point that even in the last two years, uh, the evidence had changed. That I think one was an LDL, I think, uh, example. And it was very difficult, and they went to, it was an ACO measure, and they went to CMS and said, well, if we want this taken out, because our doctors don't want to do it, because here's the paper. And they said, well, we can't remove it. It's there. <laughs> so I think it's, it's that kind of maybe brainstorming that maybe Maryland can be a leader in trying to tear these things. They all feed in, you know, they all feed into each other, but perhaps that's the sort of, you know, this type of work group can perhaps have some of, you know, the experts like Peter and others just brainstorm and see at what level should these things make sense for, for that, the two or three key stakeholder groups. I like that idea. I'm thinking of, you know, consumer reports for cars. And, it you know, it's just, it is a wonderful analogy. You see what you want to. Right. You know, how far it goes on. Right. And how much miles, the, how many the miles? domains that I care about. How safe it is. Someone else better be looking at other things. I expect that, but I don't want to. So I, I actually like that kind of vision. Yeah, so you, the under the hood measures. Yeah. Wait, you don't want to see the oil and the, the pistons and the no. battery. And, you know, one, uh, 
I think, relatively low-hanging fruit that Maryland could do in this is also link process and outcome measures. Because what you're saying is often these process measures have no context. Right. But So presenting SKIP measures separate from SSI doesn't help anybody, doesn't help the clinicians or the consumers, right? But we could potentially link relatively simple if when you have an outcome that has process so the consumer could say, is it risk adjustment? I don't know. Well, it may be risk adjustment, but you only gave the evidence 20% of the time or 30% of the time, so it would may add more uh, context to them. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why all these are topping out, because more, most of the uh, process measures, I think there are nine of them that they are recommending to be removed. There is no differentiation between the 75th and the 95th percentile in those measures. Yeah, um, Maryland is in the process of redesigning the hospital guide, and those are the, some, of the, some of the things we want to do. Instead of spending all of our time and resources processing information and putting it on the guide to make it more meaningful, so to tie the skip measures to right. outcome measures, SSI measures. So we're, we're looking at some of that. I mean, it is a challenge because it does take expertise and time, and, but it, it would be more meaningful to consumers, definitely. I was just saying to Tom, you know, the literature, there's some mixed information out there about the processes that we have linking to the outcomes that we measure. Right. And so if we could actually do something like that yeah. here, that would be, um, that, that would be building, a, uh, that would be adding to the body of knowledge about what is known about this. Um, but I, like Carlin Crummels has done some of that work and it, it didn't, pan out the way that they would hope it would have, but doesn't mean we shouldn't try, right? Are there any comments? Thank you for these comments, and I'll look forward to getting additional ones, and we'll um, re rework parts of the paper and so we can get it to the place where it's ready to be just presented again as an informational piece at the July 9th uh, uh, commissioner's meeting. And um, I will welcome any additional comments. And please send, send email, or you can feel free to redline the text if you'd like to do that. That would uh, be helpful. Or if you want to send some general comments that, um, that I, as long as I understand what they mean, I will, like, like, so not to pick on Maddie, but you said to make <laughs> the text more accessible. So I asked three people. And we all, we all had a different idea about what you meant. So, okay. <laughs> so, so anyway, no, no, but I, again, appreciate it. Totally. <laughs> I appreciated your, your comments about it. So, um, all right. Uh, with that, we'll move to the last item on the agenda. Um, or I'll kind of second to last because there will be questions, comments from uh, the audience uh, before we adjourn. But I'm, I'm hoping that the audience, <laughs> actually the audience should probably come to the table, um, <laughs> would feel free to um, chime in as, as we've gone along here. Um, so this last slide uh, deck just discusses uh, where we're going uh, with the performance measure work group uh, going forward. The first slide has um, our short-term goal, which was to really address our hospital global model targets and, and measurements. And then in the midterm, we want to get to more uh, population-based uh, incentives, uh, both in payment, um, in, in the payment structure as well, in the quality measurement and reward and um, uh, penalty uh, areas. And then um, we also need to be preparing for uh, phase two, where, we, where we'll focus on uh, total cost of care, and that's um, for all services um, provided to um, Medicare and all payers, uh, patients in the, in the state. So this just goes through um, the phases of um, public engagement. Um, we have uh, short-term process uh, phases. Uh, we did um, have an advisory council that kicked all of these things off, and we went through the work group process. And then in, um, and then in phase two, which we're now uh, beginning in July, um, we'll continue to uh, finish the work group reports and um, 
reconvene the advisory council, and then sort of some of the work groups will finish their work, um, and others will take a break over the summer. And I think uh, ours is of that second uh, ilk. And then, um, well, I should uh, put my yes. footnote there. The subgroup, or obviously the, the related work, is continuing during the summer. So we may yeah. pull some of you together to kind of vet certain things and get some guidance. Uh, but in, in terms of larger meetings, uh, we are going to, you know, restart doing in September. Right, right. And that, uh, but that was under the hood information stuff you don't <laughs> want to know. <laughs> so, um, so we have engaged a broad set of stakeholders. Um, Eighty-five people appointed. Um, lots of meetings, lots of activity. We've gotten a lot of stuff done, and we are so um, uh, have a lot of gratitude for the uh, collaboration and effort of uh, everyone who's participated including this work group. Um, and then uh, we, as you know, we've had diverse membership. Um, and we've called for technical papers. And we've provided access to information. And we've provided ample opportunities for comment. Um, you, I'm going to skip the role of the work groups because mm -hmm. it's a rehash. Um, so we, so current process looking forward, we do need to come up with aggressive um, work plans. And that is the stuff that we're rolling up our sleeves, uh, or keeping our sleeves rolled um, throughout the summer to continue to do um, some of the work um, in, in a series of, as Julia mentioned and I did before, uh, some subgroups that can be topically focused that can do very quick turnaround and um, be agile, and uh, but also be representative of where uh, the various stakeholders are in the state and, and what their interests are. Um, and then uh, the next phase, uh, we would have less frequent meetings. We'll have these ad hoc uh, groups and, um, and definitely require a different con configuration of work groups. OK, so we've already talked about what we've done today. Um, here, uh, what we have is um, we have some remaining tasks for, um, I guess, mid no, near term, short term, um, which is the, uh, still 14. You see, I'm confused and you're confused, Ed. Um, efficiency measurement, we have to finish that up um, and finish the methodologies. Um, we, we have a potentially avoidable utilization measurement um, that we apply in, in determining hospitals' global budgets um, in a, as, a, as a small component. But may, there may be other applications for using those a potentially avoidable utilization methodology. So we have to think about that. And then we have to risk adjust uh, readmissions for things that are um, have to do with a, a dem demographic, socio-demographic adjustments um, uh, so that we can more fairly measure readmissions across hospitals. So those are the short-term tasks for probably uh, calendar 15 um, implementation. And then. Um, there are some other tasks that these GBR, global budget uh, tasks, are more in the realm of the payment models work group. And then um, in the fall winter tasks, we'll also um, have MHAC program updates, readmission updates, and, and new measure domains planning. And then there are several of these uh, subgroups that we mentioned. And I'll just kind of highlight the ones that we think the performance measurement work group will be more likely to uh, engage with and interact with and collaborate with um, over the short and mid and long term. And that includes, of course, efficiency um, and with all these various uh, measures of potentially avoidable utilization, the reasonableness of charges or the, the next iteration of that, the per member per, or per person per month measurements, a total cost of care, while how to measure it is a payment potentially a payment model uh, task, um, how to monitor that, um, and how we want that measure to uh, be articulated is something that we certainly will weigh in on. And I think um, we, we need to engage with the physician alignment subgroup because uh, they one of their goals is to improve care and to improve care coordination. And we need if we're improving care, how do we know we're improving care? We need to measure how we're improving care. 
Um, and the same thing with um, we need meaningful measurements of um, care coordination. And then I think um, along the lines of um, uh, care transitions, we also would need to engage with the long-term and post-acute care uh, work group as well. I guess one kind of coming out of this one is, you know, in the beginning we had very defined work plans, aggressive timelines, and very specific tasks to accomplish. And it worked to segment the topics in the four work groups. As we are moving to stage two, where our work plan becomes broader and multifaceted, um, sometimes it's challenging to address the care coordination in one work group and the measurement side on the performance. So we think that uh, there will be a need to have more overall discussions from beginning to the end, including the performance measurement. So um, apart from these sh short-term uh, subgroups, you know, as the topics come in, uh, our intention is to make sure that the, all the related questions are addressed in the same forum rather than trying to segment them to different people. Um, and I think this is especially going to be true for care coordination, uh, where um, we've been discussing the interventions in one group, data infrastructure and other, and, and the performance measurement on this one. Um, I think that's going to be the one that we really are going to pay more attention to make sure we have all the facets in, in the same area. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, I feel like we've run up against that. Um, the, the division among the current work groups um, was fine for division of labor, um, but um, we really ran up against um, trying to coordinate how the, the measures, the payment model, and the data infrastructure all fit together. And I think if our focus really is patient-centered and population-based, um, we've got to bring all of those things together. And I'm glad to see that the physician alignment group is going to continue and not go away because I think we only need to be thinking more broadly about, um, even though we're hospital focused, more broadly about um, the patient centeredness and, and um, the, the need to be population based. So it's not about uh, any one particular provider group. And then the, the remainder of the work groups in, uh, that we may have an opportunity to, um, again, work in this fluid manner that Shule described or um, uh, here, mainly the GBR reporting template, since it is a performance measurement uh, kind of aspect to that, and uh, uh, GBR infrastructure investment reporting. Um, and then, of course, there's always the other as needed group. So, you know, again, the, the, the division of labor, you probably didn't read the GBR contracts in detail like the payment model workers did. In, in those contracts, um, there is a specific requirement for hospitals to report certain elements, driven, like similar to our scorecard, but a more, um, much more technical and more, uh, I think, much more indicated there. So uh, we decided to bring a group of people together to finalize and make that uniform so it will be easy for hospitals to report and for us to analyze. In the infrastructure investment reporting, um, there is an additional revenues provided to the GBR hospitals to invest in population-based um, uh, care. And, and similar to what we did with the readmission bundled project where we had the additional money and we requested hospitals to send us information how they use that money, the idea is again here, same um, for hospitals to come up with a template and reporting tool for them to report back to us what in, you know, how they are using that money, what investments they are making with that money, maybe even with the other additional resources that they find so that we have the, uh, a better picture of the intervention side, you know, grounds on the boot type of thing. And DHMH is very interested in that type of um, boots on the ground, right? Yeah, no, no, thank you. No, no, I, I like it the other way, actually. <laughs> So, um, so you know, the HMH and MHA has been using the, the readmission template a lot, and it, I think it's, we are going to create a similar template for a general investment in that area. And we are also thinking to use that in terms of our evaluation activities for the new model um, as well. Thank you. Um, and then uh, finally, so we're finishing these reports. We're going to implement the ba balance dashboard, and um, we're going to convene a uh, formal meeting in September of the group, but really, um, in the meantime, 
will, there'll be lots and lots of work happening. And so if there are folks who anticipated this would be done and, you know, I didn't even think about this, if your commitments are such that you would like to reevaluate, um, we will reject all emails related to that. No. <laughs> well, <laughs> well um, you know, of course, that, that's a, a given that, um, you know, we, we appreciate the free labor, so, but we understand that there are, you know, people may have constraints, so we, we want to be sensitive to that. Yeah. Are there any comments from anybody on the phone or any questions? And in lieu of sending a survey for like how we did, are there any things that you think we should do better, you know, starting from scheduling to the topics or uh, you don't need to say now, you can just email Serena. <laughs> Wait, no, uh, seriously, if, if, if there are things that um, we could do better in the next round, um, we'll, we'll always, you know, as you know, we we'll always welcome the uh, comments. Is it, uh, is it too impolite to, to say uh, Friday afternoon in the summer up here, trying to get home <laughs> is really tough? <laughs> I'm with you on that because we're both going to Annapolis, so. <laughs> well, so Friday mornings, Fridays are, seem to be a really good day. It seems that um, we've had better success, so maybe the morning would be a better uh, choice. And maybe we'll have a standing time, and if we don't need, we'll cancel it. But at least you know every third week of a month, we'll try to fit that in a little bit. Anything the first thing Monday morning. Okay. <laughs> okay. I know we've, we've had to do that sometimes in the past, and it, mm -hmm. it's hard in the hospital setting. But anything else? No, right. Go for it. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you.